Hmm. Hello, everybody. Hey, everybody. We're a minute late letting you in, for which I apologize. It's, it's been internet hijinks at my house, so I was running behind the times a little bit. Anyway, it's great to see you all. Uh, welcome to this uh, meeting of Carpentry of Bird Watchers for Thursday, October 22nd, I want to say. And uh, today's topic is ducks. Oh, how can I so we'll be talking about ducks. Yeah. And I see Brody has a duck in his background. This is great. Every time you have a, Brody. a, a meeting-specific virtual background in Zoom, which is really cool. <laughs> I don't like so it looks like you have a, a mandarin duck there. I don't know it's Brody's good, but it just doesn't show up on the screen. All right, so uh, I'm going to ask for people to go ahead and, and mute yourselves or uh, one of our co-hosts, uh, Tom Beland and Laura Luby and Jenny Slaughter. Uh, are, I believe, empowered to mute you for me if you are able to mute yourself. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions and just jump in at any time. Uh, but just to keep me from being more distracted than I otherwise would be, it's, it's helpful if it can be kind of quiet while I'm talking. Um, and with that said, uh, does anyone have any, any cool new birds they've seen that they want to want to share about? I want to swatch this bird. It's on over. Yeah, I, I've seen... Laurel and I and our friends Mickey and Ryan went out Tuesday. We started at the Botanical Gardens and got to see the gray catbird. Then we headed off to the Goleta Beach, UCSB, and saw the Pacific Golden Plover. After that, we went to Hollister Ave to, I think the place is called... Log, Log Me In? Yes. Yeah. And saw the Morning Wobbler and the McGillivray Wobbler. So, we had a pretty successful day Tuesday. Yeah, but it's we, been really, I was going to say, it's been a really busy find, week. Yeah, it was a busy week. This morning, we couldn't find, we were out looking for the magnolia wobbler, but we, we never found it. So, so the one at um, uh, the Ortega Ridge Pine yes, area? Yeah, yeah, we were up there today. So, but it was a good week. So. Yeah, there were a lot of cool birds out there to be seen. Yes. Um, anyone else have any they want to? Share about any recent fun bird sightings? Yeah, Larry, I see you got your, your hand up. Can you unmute? Yes, and, and yes I'll un oh, hi, I'll unmute myself. Um, I was shooting some video of my friend in my driveway this morning and a seagull came overhead and was making a bit of a racket, but I was thinking that will be appropriate for anybody to know that there's seagulls in our area. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We in fact had, you know, two meetings just on, on gulls and gull identification. And it's a, a famously sort of thorny topic of, of bird education to, to, to learn your gulls. And uh, if, you, if you have video to share, I'd, I'd look forward to seeing it. We can, we can try and narrow down the identification. We can figure out, was it a Western gull or what else it might've been? But that'll be fun if and when we can do that. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, any, other, any other birds to share? Yeah, all right. Uh, okay, someone, you're, is someone uh, indicating something that I'm not seeing? Brody, I see you're waving your hand. What have, what have you got to share? Um, I've been seeing some scaly breasted munias. So those little, those little tiny brown guys, right? Yeah, and then they have like scales on their breasts. Yeah, they were yeah, originally fair. brought in from Australia, I'm pretty sure. So you've got those around where you live? Yeah, there was a they whole just start, They just started coming into my bird feeders. Neat. Yeah, there was a whole discussion of them and their their occurrence in the, the northern part of the county, which I guess is, you know, for many years they were in the south county on our side of the San Inez Mountains, but they weren't in the, the rest of the county. And just in the last, you know, several years, they've started showing up in other places. And I guess someone was asking about them because I saw them at Ocean Beach Park out by Lompo. So yeah, they're they're spreading around. Uh, Nancy, I see you were you were wait, yeah. raising a finger. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, we're getting those little charming munias to our bird bath in about a dozen every evening. They like to bathe before going to bed. It appears. And the other thing I've really been enjoying are hearing the great horned owls duetting 
at night, just as it gets dusk and in the morning, the pairs are calling out to each other and sort of getting ready to get amorous. Yeah, and they have like just a little bit of a different pitch so you can kind of keep track of, of the two different birds. Yeah. Yeah, that's really fun. Okay, well, uh, I had yeah. a few things uh, I wanted to share before we jumped into the ducks. Tom, I saw you, you raised your hand there. Do you have something else? Did you want to talk about the, uh, uh, the questionnaire? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. Uh, can, are you prepared to talk about the questionnaire? Because... All I wanted to do is tell people that they still have, they could still fill out the questionnaire. Uh, you know, all that information will be helpful to John when he talks about rare birds, which is eBird and Santa Barbara uh, County burning is how we did see our uh, all our rare birds Tuesday. So, so you still fill it up. Okay, and and so they would have known about this because they would have received an email from you telling them where to go to fill out the questionnaire. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so if anyone yeah. has not seen that bug Tom <laughs> after the meeting, you can yeah. okay. you can send them an email. Uh, you know, we should probably we can put a post about it on the blog. If, if, if um, I can just do that myself, I have a link to it, right? Cause you sent me an email. So I'll, I'll make a blog post about it on the, on the carpwithoutcars.org blog. So if you want to, you know, if you haven't seen the questionnaire and you want to fill it out and, and this is just to get an idea of what people are interested in knowing more about with respect to uh, eBird and the SBCO birding email list and just kind of how you learn about rare sightings in the area and how you might go about chasing after them right. if you were inclined to do that. So yeah, thank you guys very much for, for doing that and taking care of that. And then Courtney, I see you got a hand up there. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, my wife and I are still learning the nuances of eBird. And so maybe you can answer a question that's been on our minds. What happened with the whole thing with the Bob Whites? Uh, so I'm not too sure. You're talking about the Bob Whites that were being reported from uh, uh, Lake, Los uh, Lake Los Carneros? Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm vague on this whole topic, but uh, my understanding is that there were a couple of Bob White quail, which is a you know common eastern species, but very much not a common species around here, that were reported at Lake Los Carneros, and people were going there and seeing them and reporting them in eBird. Um, the comment I saw, I think from maybe Jamie Chavez, the, the moderator of SPCO birding was, or someone at least was, you know, this is not officially a countable bird in Santa Barbara County or in California that presumably these are escapees. These are birds that uh, arrived at that location because they were you know, they, with human assistance. They were part of a captive flock that, that got away or something like that. So, uh, you know, they're fun to see, uh, but technically if you, care about the, the technicalities of your, your listing and your list total, you should not be listing them, uh, or at least you shouldn't be counting them towards your, your total species in bragging rights terms, because they're, it's like going to the zoo. You, know, you can't go to the zoo and say, oh, you know, I saw California condors at the zoo. Those are not wild condors, so you shouldn't add them to your wild bird list. But it's, you know, it gets into a gray area sometimes. Is there somewhere on eBird where we might know that? We just noticed that they suddenly there was no more mention of them, but how would we know that? Um, yeah, I'm not sure about on eBird. Like eBird has general information that says, oh, you know, you should not report non-wild birds. You shouldn't report captive birds or, um, the, you know, because it gets into a gray area, there are plenty of times where a bird appears and it's not really obvious if it had human help to get there. There was a, a gargany, you know, a, a Eurasian duck species that's quite rare uh, around here that was in Santa Maria a few years ago at Waller Park and a bunch of people were going there and, you know, it's sort of like they don't want to list it if they're not officially allowed to. But the California Bird Records Committee, this group of people that you know meet periodically to, to rule on questions like this, uh, hadn't met yet. So people were basically going and seeing the bird and recording it in eBird as as a you know just in case. Like if it is allowed by the by the CBRC, then they'll get to have it on their list. And they wouldn't want to avoid going to see it until after the CBRC rules because the bird could very well be gone by then. So I believe eventually that bird was accepted by the CBRC. And you know, they're looking at things like, is there evidence that the bird was ever in captivity and you know, other stuff like that. So 
eBird doesn't really, I mean, they have their advice about not, you know, occasionally someone, a list will show up in eBird where someone goes to a zoo and puts in like 30 exotic species that they counted in a zoo. And that's very much frowned upon. They don't want you to do that. Um, and, you know, the reviewers in eBird will just, you know, flag that list as, as not uh, official, so it, it doesn't show up in, in search results and things like that. And that may have happened with the Bob Whites. You know, the eBird reviewers may have flagged those uh, reports as not officially, I forget what the word is, when they do their moderation process and they approve or unapprove it. But uh, anyway, I, I, I could go on, but I've gone on for a while already, and I think I'll just sort of leave it at that. Uh, you know, you're welcome to go check that out if you you know, use the search function on eBird, you can find information about, you know, reporting non-wild birds or what their policies are. Um, I think Thank there you. may have also been a request by the, the moderators of uh, the SPCO birding email list, like, let's stop talking about these quails because they're not officially part of our subject matter or something. I don't know if they did that or not. Um, okay. Uh, anything else from anybody else before we, we move on? See, there is a chat, something in the chat. Oh, thanks, Eve. Uh, yeah, the official list of California birds. So that would give you your, your list of which birds are officially countable, at least potentially. Uh, although again, in, in the case of an individual bird, it may actually be something that you know has to be analyzed in more detail by the powers that be before you know if it's actually quote unquote listable. Okay, uh, so there were a couple of things I wanted to mention before we jumped into talking about ducks and um, one is uh, Nancy Barron, who's in the meeting. Hello, Nancy. Uh, has been writing some really wonderful articles that show up in the Coastal View, uh, the, the local carpentry newspaper, and uh, about birds and other uh, nature topics. And there was a recent one in there that I really loved that was about the, the uh, Townsend's warbler migration and some of the challenges that birds face in migration. And I don't know, uh, Nancy, do you? Uh, Karen, since you're here, do you want to share anything about that piece or about your writing? I, I have a link to it in the, the YouTube description for our live stream and on the blog post about this meeting at Carp Without Cars. But is there anything else you wanted to say about, uh, about that article? Uh, you're muted. Let me unmute you. Let's see, you're still muted. Maybe you could, there we go. Yeah. Uh, no, if you want to drop the link in the chat, if anybody, it might be an easy way for folks to see it. But yeah, I'm doing them on a monthly basis. Uh, it was a response to COVID when suddenly I found myself at home because I usually travel a lot for my work. So I've been writing these, I don't know if, if any of you have seen these in the naturehood columns. Um, the last one I did was, I'm from British Columbia originally, so I tracked a bird that uh, breeds the Townsend's warbler on Vancouver Island. And uh, talked to a lot of, I try to every time talk to specialists about the birds and talk to the folks at Cornell. And they told me that the birds that come to California are strictly the ones from British Columbia and Vancouver Island in particular. So I thought that was pretty cool. And it was during the time of the fires. So I was just, you know, imagining what is it like to be a bird making these amazing, always, always, you know, kind of life threatening uh, migrations, but especially under these conditions. And John has been a wonderful resource to me. I uh, phone and chat with him very often to pick his brains on things. And he also is super generous. The photos in there are his, and there's a couple of really lovely ones. So uh, yeah, it's nice to have uh, this community, you know, uh, I guess hive mind too. And um, if any of you have topics that you're especially interested in, um, you know, I'd love to hear about them. My next one's going to be on owls as we're coming into breeding season for them. So thanks, John. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. And I, and I apologize, I didn't have any photos of, of barn owls to share, but hopefully you can, you can find some suitable photos somewhere. Um, okay, uh, just a few other quick mentions. Uh, people have been asking about the Christmas bird count and uh, I am these days the organizer of the Carpinteria Christmas bird count. Uh, where we go out on a particular day in a 15 mile diameter circle and count as many birds as we can. It's a lot of fun. A lot of you have, have done it before and are familiar with it. This year is a little unusual in that with the, the pandemic, there are additional restrictions and the National Audubon Society, which is sort of the umbrella organization for the, the Christmas bird counts, has uh, requested that the count organizers 
not make a final decision on whether or not they're going to even have a count until November 15th. So they want us to be closer to the date of the event. Uh, so I'm certainly going to follow their guidelines on that. Uh, but assuming that we do end up having a count, which I think at this point is a, a pretty good bet that we'll be able to go have some version of that count. It is currently scheduled for December 19th in Carpinteria, which is the, the first Saturday of the three week count window. So if any of you are available that day, uh, I would love for you to participate in the Carpinteria Christmas bird count. Um, there will be some, you know, extra restrictions this year, probably, you know, we won't be having people carpool with each other. We won't have our in-person get together uh, that night for the compilation. The compilation will probably look sort of like the Zoom meeting uh, where we'll go over the birds we saw uh, virtually. Um, but I, I won't put any more details about, I won't take more time with that for right now, but if you go to the carpwithoutcars.org blog, there is a link to information about the, the Christmas bird count and you can see more details there. And there will shortly be a form, a link to a form that you can use to sign up for the count. And again, I would love for everybody to, to be part of it. And uh, even if, you know, if you're a, a relatively uh, new bird watcher, you could totally still participate. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And even I think with a little bit less, you know, social contact uh, the way we'll have to do it this year, I think it will still be a lot of fun. Uh, so anyway, we'll talk about that more later. And in fact, I'm sort of give you a preview. I, there are four more of these meetings if they're every two weeks between now and the date of the count. And I'm probably going to devote a significant amount of the upcoming meetings uh, to the Christmas bird count and kind of just talking about its history and advocating for people to participate and sort of, you know, planning out how we'll do it. So you can look forward to that if you're interested. And if you're not interested, maybe just take the next, you know, month or two off from Carpenter Bird Watchers because it's going to be a lot of Christmas bird count talk. I'm going to be pretty obsessed, I can tell already. Uh, let's see, was there anything else? Uh, uh, yeah, Annie, I see you're, you're waving your hand. Yeah, um, I think it'd be helpful. I don't know if this is part of what you're planning to do, but to have <clears throat> a review of the birds spotted previously in um, the carp bird count. Yeah, that will definitely be a part of what, what we talk about. And again, I'm, right. I'm planning to use the upcoming meetings to kind of go over that. And uh, a lot of strategizing, a lot of like, okay, we've had this bird, you know, nine times, we missed it three times, let's make sure we get it this time. Or we've had this bird twice and be really great to have it this time. Uh, great. And, you know, we have never had uh, 180 species for the carpentry account. We've had 179, I think twice. Uh, but in the, the 12 years of the count, we've never made it to 180. So maybe this will be the year. It'd be very exciting if we could get there. We were so close last time. There were birds that were out there to be got and just poor organization by me, I think, led to us not getting them the day of the count. So I'm, I'm committed that this year we will do better in that area. Um, uh, I'm just going to skip faster pretty quick, but there was a, uh, I had a note that I wanted to share. So in our last meeting about sparrows, you know, I, I really went in deep on sparrows and talked about the Spazella sparrows and how con potentially confusing they are. And I made a grand show of like, oh, and this is the chipping sparrow. And this is the brewer sparrow. And this is the clay colored sparrow. And here's how you can tell them apart. And like a couple days after that meeting, I went out birding at Santa Monica Creek near my house. And there was a Spazella sparrow that was very unusual for that spot. And I took photos of it and I posted it to eBird as a brewer's sparrow because they said, oh, it has a relatively plain face pattern. And within an hour, I had two different experts uh, very kindly and helpfully point out the various features that made this a clay colored sparrow. So uh, I was a little embarrassed, but also happy because clay colored is probably a harder sparrow to get in Santa Barbara County. So that, and it was a new bird for me either way for the year. So that was, that was pleasant, but a good reminder to me and to all of us here, don't take the stuff I say, you know, too seriously. I am still learning this stuff myself and those sparrows. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, anything else? Oh, and so one last thing, and I, then I promise we'll get to ducks. Uh, I've been listening to a uh, podcast that a journalist named Ashley Ahern uh, has made. It's an eight-part series on the greater sage grouse. Uh, it's just called Grouse, and there is a link to it, again, in the, the YouTube live stream description and in the, the blog post at carpetoutcars.org about this meeting. And I just, I really love it. There's been seven of the episodes that have come out so far. There's one, the final episode is coming out next week. Um, and, you know, I'm, 
I'm into land use issues. It's sort of a thing that I've been involved in for a while and I'm really into sage grouse and I've done some, some birding in sagebrush country in the Eastern Sierra and I've seen you know, the sage grouse out on their leks and it's, uh, it's just a really great podcast that I highly recommend. And um, one thing I will say, uh, just as a sort of content warning, I know we have at least one younger member of the group. Uh, she does occasionally use some colorful language. Uh, she uses profanity a few times. She, Ashley Ahern is a former NPR reporter and I think she enjoys the fact that she's no longer reporting for NPR and she can you know, curse when the situation calls for it. So there is some adult language in the uh, um, uh, podcast. So, you know, Brody, maybe check with your parents before you, before you check that out uh, to make sure it's okay with them. But uh, with that proviso, I, I'll just say I, I highly recommend it. And um, I see, uh, was it Nancy saying that she's a good friend of yours? Well, that's awesome. That is totally cool. I, uh, I did not know that. And yeah, tell her that I'm, I'm really enjoying listening to it and I if you talk to her and I can't wait to hear the last episode. Okay, um, yeah, uh, you're muted, Nancy. Are you uh, replying? Let me unmute you if I can. I was just gonna say, Ashley, this project that she's taken on is a real labor of love. Um, and as John said, she was an NPR reporter living in Seattle. She and her husband decided that they were just gonna go and she left a super plum job started uh, working for Birdsong, first of all, and then proposed this sage grouse podcast series and is a cowgirl. She's got a horse, she loves her horse. She's got to know all the local cowboys. Uh, she talks a lot about how some of them don't believe in climate change. She's working on having those conversations with them. So she's really become an agent of change in this rural community of Winthrop. And it's just, you know, uh, and she's, and she works, she's worked with me because I work with scientists, um, helping them communicate their science. And she's worked with these scientists trying to get them to bring their love and passion for birds and not just present their data. And she's done it just so beautifully in that podcast series. So she'll be thrilled that you were <laughs> singing her praises, John. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's it's one of the <laughs> best things I've you know listened to in, in a long time. So I, I definitely encourage people to check it out. Um, okay, uh, so I think that is everything. <laughs> anything else? Um, anything else people want to share, or, or before we jump into the the duck content? I I just put up a. It's not recent, but it's one of our family's favorite ducks. I'll move out of the way. Um, <clears throat> it's the Harlequin duck that we saw um, in Cannon Beach a while ago, along with puffins. So since I found it, I just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> ah. Yeah, thank you. And that is that is just a gorgeous duck. I, um, I have seen them once in my life. I, I chased after one up in, I think, San Luis Obispo County at Avila Beach. And, you know, was out there with my scope on the pier, just like looking at this very, very distant, I can manage to get just some some really very poor, very distant photos of what I think was a harlequin duck. So it was it was very exciting for me, although you could barely even detect it in the photos. But I, I look forward to seeing one as as clearly as it is in your your backdrop there, Annie. That would be that would be an experience for sure. Okay. Uh, well, uh, speaking of ducks, let us move on and do ducks. So um, you've all been very patient, which I very much appreciate. Uh, but I'm going to share my screen, and we will start the presentation officially. Uh, let's see, I don't think, John, okay, if I have done this correctly, you should be seeing a duck. So give me a thumbs up if you can see a duck. Yay, all right, thank you. Um, and just a reminder, you know, when I'm doing the presentation, when I'm in the screen sharing mode, I can only see a few thumbnails. So if you're, uh, you know, if there are people out there waving their hands and I don't see you, I apologize in advance. Just unmute and jump in and, and just say, excuse me, I have something to share about this duck. Anyway, so let's talk about ducks. Uh, here is a duck. <laughs> and I, I will just say for the record, because I always say this, that ducks are very cool. They're a very cool group of birds. Um, here is a, a really stunning duck that has just started to show up again in the area. And I'm actually going to click through to the uh, status and trends graph on, 
all about birds um, because I just think the migration that, that a lot of these ducks uh, and the green winged teal, which is what we're looking at here in particular, uh, the, the migration they do is just really impressive. So these are these uh, status and trends animations we've looked at before where it's showing you for each week in the year what the abundance is of this species. And you can just see that, you know, they go from being way up in the Arctic uh, when they're breeding and then they're all way back down in the southern part of the, the country and on into Mexico uh, during the winter months. So it's just really impressive. I, I've already kind of gone on for a long time before we even got into the duck ID stuff. So I'm not going to spend a bunch more time on it. Uh, but just as, you know, be aware when you see those ducks in our local waterways and whatnot that uh, they are working very hard <laughs> throughout the year to get where you see them. Um, so here's the, the eBird histogram. Uh, that again, we, we look at a lot of times when we do these, these meetings. Um, these are not quite all of the ducks you can see in Santa Barbara County. I took a few of the rarer ones out, uh, and I'm not going to talk about all of these at all. I, I, I just sort of picked some highlights from here to, to actually look at in detail. But this kind of shows you uh, that we are very much entering duck season now as we get to the later part of October. So in Santa Barbara County, there's a few ducks we have throughout the year, you know, mallards, you know, you can find pretty much any week in the year pretty readily. Gadwall, a little hard to find in the summer months. Um, cinnamon teal, same thing. Uh, ruddy duck, we have pretty much throughout the year. Uh, but with most other species, um, it's really the fall and winter on into the early spring is, is when you see them around here. So this is very much the time to go out and, and look for ducks. And uh, I don't, I just, uh, I think they're, they're really fun. Uh, if you have a spotting scope, it can be helpful because a lot of times they're out on the water and kind of far away. Um, but on the John? other hand, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, could you just repeat the ones that we have all year long? Mallards, Gadwits, what else? I did miss the yeah. third. Yeah, so just, I mean, just looking at these, these green bars, you know, the ones that are still thick during the summer months are the okay. mallard, uh, the ruddy duck, um, surf scoter we have a little bit in the winter months. That's a, a you know an ocean duck. You're going to see that out you know along the coast. Um, gadwall, cinnamon teal maybe. Although I certainly don't see that a lot in the summer months around here. That may okay. be in other parts of the county that are producing those records. And Thank that's, you. Yeah, and that's pretty much it for the the common ones during the summer because they're all up you know they're up in the north breeding. They they they're highly migratory. They they can cover a lot of distance and they get up there to do their breeding where it's uh, more conducive to that. And then they, they head back this way before the ice and snow comes in. When you okay. say they breed up north, how far north are you talking about, John? Well, it depends on the species. Uh, like in that green winged teal animation we saw, they're all the way up at the, you know, northern Canada, up around the Arctic Circle. Oh. Um, oh, really? And, you know, not all of them go that far, but some of them do. Uh, you know, they're, again, that's, you know, wide expanses of water and vegetation and insects and all of those are really good for, for ducks trying to rear their babies. Um, but then again, before the ice and snow hits, they need to, you know, get out of there and, and head south to where there's open water that they can use. Okay, so I'm gonna go through just some identifications of these ducks. And if you've seen this, we've done this presentation in the past and we still were meeting in the, the Carpentry Library. So. What I've done here is I've, I've blocked off the male ducks. So ducks are, you know, identifying ducks is kind of a fun challenge and you can play this game on easy mode or hard mode. And easy mode is you just identify the males because they're very distinctive looking. Uh, certainly, you know, in, their, in the winter time when they're doing the recording and you see them in their, their, their you know, best plumages, their, their most vivid plumages. Uh, the female ducks tend to be a lot more drab because they're the ones that are sitting on the eggs up there in the tundra and, and you know it's a very hazardous thing for them to do so they have to be highly camouflaged. So they tend to be kind of brown and mottled. Uh, so telling the females apart can sometimes be challenging and of course that's part of the fun. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go through these and I'm going to show you the females first and you can try and do your best to figure out what kind of duck we're looking at and then I'll reveal the male and hopefully for some of you at least it will become much easier at that point. And then finally, I will reveal the, the name of the duck. So uh, here's our first duck. And just to kind of give you uh, uh, hints, I mean, this is 
probably the most common duck in the county. And I'm sort of going in reverse order. Like I'm starting with the really common ones and kind of working my way down uh, and grouping them together. So similar ones are together more, but anyway, there is the female, uh, here is the male. And at this point, if you've, you know, been to a city park <laughs> with a loaf of bread or, you know, you've probably seen these ducks up close. This is of course the, the mallard, which is the most common duck in our county and pretty common throughout North America, I think. But the, the males are quite stunning. And the, you know, the females, you know, it's sort of your, your default big dabbling duck. You know, I didn't really talk about this yet, but so ducks tend to come in a couple of varieties. There's the dabbling ducks and the diving ducks. And the dabbling ducks are very buoyant and they, they sort of float really high in the water. And when they want to feed on uh, underwater vegetation, they do it by tipping up so their tails stick up out of the water and they reach down with their their beaks and they're grabbing the weeds or whatever down there and then they come back up. Uh, diving ducks, as the name uh, makes clear, they actually dive underwater and they can they can go down there and swim around underwater and go after stuff. Uh, so uh, and then the other sort of major difference between the dabbling ducks and the diving ducks, the dabbling ducks can take off straight from the water. Like if they get scared and they want to get out of there, they just boom, they just pop right up out of the water. And I was looking at some some cool content on that. The first stroke of their wings, they actually are pushing against the water. That's their, they use that to kind of launch themselves into the air. <clears throat> and then with some quick flapping, they can get up and going. Uh, the diving ducks tend to have to run along the surface of the water and gain speed before they can take off. So when you're, you're looking at your ducks and they're skittering away from you, you, you know, oh, it's probably not a dabbling duck, it's probably a diving duck. And anyway, let's go on to some more ducks. All right, so here is a duck. Uh, and this one's, you can't really tell because it's by itself in the photo, but this is a little duck. This is a relatively small duck. If this duck and this female duck was next to a female mallard, like from that last photo, this one would be about like three quarters the size of that mallard. It's just like a little fun sized candy bar of a duck, very small. Um, but some things um, to look, did someone have a comment? Can I say what it might be? Sure, yeah, what do you think it is, Brody? Uh, maybe a Godwall or blue wing teal, one of the two? Well, it could be one of the two, but it in fact is neither one, but that, those were good guesses. So uh, yeah, gadwall, you know, it has the basic appearance of a gadwall and gadwall would, would have been smart for me to put next to the mallard because they are confusingly similar to the mallard in terms of the females at least. Um, but no, a gadwall is about the same size as a mallard. So again, that's not obvious in the photo, but this one is too small for that. And blue wing teal is an excellent guess because this one is pretty similar looking, the female, to the female blue wing teal. Uh, but one difference to look for is that this little strip of, of white here you see on sort of the underside of the tail, that little light streak is really helpful. That's a, a good indication that you don't have a blue wing teal, you actually have the one uh, for which the male looks like this. And with the male, it's a lot easier to tell that what you in fact have is a green wing teal. Okay. All right. So, I, and but that was those were good guesses. And again, I always appreciate Brody that you were willing to make those guesses. You know, us us older birders, we you know we've been knocked around by the world. We're too embarrassed. We don't want to you know make ourselves look dumb in front of all the people in the Zoom call. But you're ready to jump right in there and, and make a guess. And we should all be as brave as you. That would be that would be good. All right. Let's move on to another deck. All right. Uh, so. Uh, Give you a big hint. <laughs> this is the one you were just talking about. Here is a female uh, teal. And if you see the male next to it, it looks like this. And this is in fact the blue wing teal. And just to kind of pop back to the green wing teal. Uh, so the, with the female blue wing teal, this little white here at the base of the bill, it's not always exactly looking like that, but it kind of looks like that. And that's kind of helpful. Um, its face pattern is kind of strong, not as strong as the green wing teal, right? The female green wing teal sort of darker on the face and doesn't have that little white area at the base of the bill. And then again, the female green wing has that little white stripe there that the, the female blue wing does not have. And if they're, you know, swimming next to their mate as they often are when we see them in the winter time, um, it makes it much simpler because the male blue wing teal is quite distinctive. And again, I'm not going into a lot of detail about all the different characteristics, um, although maybe it seems like I am. Uh, but you know, consult your field guide and you know, ducks in flight have characteristic wing 
uh, appearances that are worth checking out and uh, and go out and study your ducks, you know, once you, as you learn them, the, the trickier ones get, get easier. Does the uh, female um, green wing teal have a circle around its eye like this one? Yeah, uh, they, they typically do have these sort of light eye arcs above and below the eye. The green Again, wing? On the green wing, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we go back to the green wing. The green wing in this case does not. So yeah, I would say, yeah, they tend not to have that. Sorry, I misspoke. So. Yeah, the, the blue wing does, the green wing does not. And then there's a third teal that we're going to get to in just a second. And really, you got to kind of deal with all three of them because, <laughs> you know, they're all, if you see these little ducks around here, and, you know, you can tell it's one of these three teal, but then you got to get into the details, at least with the females. And, you know, it's also the case that uh, the, you know, I say that the females associate with the males of the same species, but they also kind of mix together sometimes. Like you'll have a flock with a bunch of, blue wing teals, and maybe there's a green wing teal in there with them, you know, it doesn't have another green wing teal to hang out with, so it's hanging out with the blue wing teals, or vice versa. Um, and sure. that's, uh, yeah, and Amrita, you had a comment? Yeah, I just was wanted to ask you, when I'm looking at uh, the guidebooks, it doesn't have any photographs of immature ducks. Does that mean that really the differences are just female male as far as coloration or whatever? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's, again, it's, it's specific to each species because they each have their own, you know, uh, plumages and their own okay. uh, places they show up at different times. But it tends to be the case that, you know, we don't see the really young ducks here because they, except for the ones that breed locally, but most of them are breeding fairly far away. So by the time we see them, they're already in their kind of, you know, first winter plumage, and they tend to look a lot like the female duck. And, and okay. then as they, as they molt over the course of that first winter, you know, the males will start to look more like male ducks, you know, that we're used to seeing. Um, it gets quite complicated. Uh, again, you know, consult your field guide, consult the photos mm -hmm. on eBird and, and at mm -hmm. All About Birds. And, uh, you know, and, and don't listen to me because I, you know, I know as much as I've needed to know to kind of get by, but I'm not a duck expert by any means. Thanks. Okay, let's, yeah, you're welcome. Let's go on to our, our third teal. And this is the third teal. And again, so the the relatively tricky compare the, the trickiest comparison amongst these three birds is the female of this species. Uh, if the male is not present, but the male is present, you go, oh, it's a cinnamon teal. It's quite clearly, uh, that's a very distinctive looking male bird. Um, right. But it's the female cinnamon teal versus the female blue wing teal. And, you know, and the first year birds in particular could be very similar. The, 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 you know, the first year blue wing versus the first year cinnamon. Um, mm. And there are those who claim to be able to reliably tell the difference between them. Uh, a lot of the time I'm putting blue wing slash cinnamon teal in my, my eBird checklist for those first year birds because I just have a very hard time telling them apart. But in the adult female, this is your blue wing teal look and this is your cinnamon teal. And so the cinnamon teal female, it's got a, a planar face. It still mm -hmm. has some light at the base of the bill, but it's not as extensive as the blue wing teal adult females, white at the base mm -hmm. of the bills. And then the other thing is it's got a relatively large beak. This sort of big flattened mm. out bill is a cinnamon teal characteristic. But there's a lot of individual variation. You know, I've seen blue wing teals and I go, wow, that beak looks awfully big. And I've seen cinnamon teals are like, well, that looks the same size as a blue wing teal. What's going on? So, you know, put it on the list of characteristics and run through the whole list and see if you can argue it either way in your head before you come to a conclusion. And then take a photo and be prepared to be corrected by the experts when, when the people at Eber look at it and get back to you and say, ah, oh, you know, your, your sparrow actually is a clay colored sparrow. All right, let's move on to, to some more ducks because there's a lot more ducks. All right, so here is a duck that has a, a characteristic feature that is quite distinctive, uh, even in the female. Um, Can I see this one? Sure. Northern shoveler, that one. You are I... exactly right, Brody. That is a northern shoveler and uh, the male as well. And that giant bill is just very clear. You know, once you get, you know, you yeah. should always be focused on on the beak as a, as a key characteristic, almost always with, with most birds because, you know, they use their beaks for, for food gathering and, and they tend to be very specialized, you know, for the specific species and its strategies that it uses to, to stay alive. So their beaks tend to be distinctive. 
And in the case of the Northern Shoveler, that beak is very distinctive. Um, I didn't even realize this until a year or so ago, but they, they do this thing where they will swim around in a circle as a group and they'll be like stirring up a little vortex of, of water which like lofting stuff up from deep in the water that they're all like collaborating to bring it up to the surface. And it, it just looks wild. It's like there'll be 10 or 12 of these birds that all like going around in a circle. I saw that at Lake Los Carneros one day. I thought it was the coolest thing. Yeah, um, and uh, I've seen that on a PBS DVD that I got once and oh. it's all about ducks. Yeah, it has a bunch of different types of ducks in it. And, it shows them going around in a little circle. Neat. Yeah, that, that was really cool. I had not seen that until they were at, uh, where was, it was at Lake Los Carneros that I saw. A very good spot to go see ducks out in, you know, sort of Western, or like, I guess it's in Goleta, technically. Very good spot for duck watching. All right, Northern Shuffler. All right, so, you know, I could have picked a better photo for this. I'm now realizing. Um, because one of the key features of this female duck is it's very long, graceful neck. Like if its head were not tucked in the way it is now, you'd see it's got a fairly, it's got a long neck. Kind of sticks up and sort of slim and graceful. Brody, what do you think it is? Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it could be a long tailed duck. Well, it does have a long tail. So technically one would have to say that yes, it is a long tailed duck. But no, it is not the duck that is officially yeah. called a long-tailed duck. Let's see if it gets easier when you see the male. Here is the male bird, which has a oh. longer tail. The, <laughs> the northern pintail. The northern pintail, yeah. And uh, I was very proud of myself when I learned to like sort of recognize the characteristic shape of a female northern pintail. Because once you learn you know, they're sort of like just a supermodel of a duck, you know, they're very long and slim. And, and once you learn to look for that, it, it stands out pretty dramatically. You can, you can pick them out even when they're not with the male. And if they're with the male, then, you know, it's, it's again, very, uh, very simple to, to identify. And they usually are because they um, pick out their mate like, like uh, three or four months even before the, the breeding season. Yeah, it's, that's true. And it's, it's a characteristic of a lot of these duck species that they will you know, they will pair up on the wintering grounds and then they'll migrate north together. So, you know, when they get up to the, the northern breeding grounds where, you know, time is a factor and, you know, it takes them, you know, a month to incubate the babies because the babies come out uh, precocial. So baby ducks, you've probably seen baby ducks, like baby chicks, you know, they're, they're relatively grown up when they hatch, like they can run around and feed themselves. Uh, so they have to spend a long time in the egg in order to achieve that. So, um, yeah, time is really crucial when they're on the breeding grounds. They want to get there, already made it. They don't want to get there and take time to establish territories and pair up and fight with each other. No, they, they want to get there and get down to business. So yeah, they, they form these pairs on the wintering grounds. Um, I don't think they actually mate on the, the winter grounds. I think they actually mate in the mating season, but they pick the, their pair during the winter season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, if I if I said otherwise, I misspoke. So yeah, I think that is definitely the case, and it's it's a just you know really cool with all these birds. You know, their their life cycles are one of the most fascinating things about them, and uh, ducks certainly are worth you know learning more about because they they have really cool life histories. All right, let's move on to another duck. All right, so the male was sort of in front of this female, so we we obscured a lot of the female in order to block him out, but uh, you know. It's a cool, cool duck. Um, anyone have any guesses? You know, kind of, kind of a drabber looking female, but she has some, some characteristics that stand out when you learn to look for them. All right, let's throw the male in there. Ready to go. Tom, did you have a guess? I did, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, that often happens in the field. You know, you see a female duck, you think, oh, I think it's this. And then the male comes into view, and you're like, oh, wait a second, let me reconsider. Um, um, Brody, yes, how you had your hand up. Could it be a American widgeon? It yeah. could, and it is, yes. And I'm ready, were you going to say the same thing? Yes. You would both be right. This is an American widgeon. Very cool duck. I'm going to just say that. I record myself saying it's a very cool duck. I could save myself a lot of a lot of effort if I just played that every time. Because they are, they are also cool. 
All right, here is a, a female duck that is not always as distinctive looking as it is in this photo. Like they don't always show you this, this white, uh, this white speculum, this white patch in their, their secondary feathers. But if they do, it's very helpful. Brody? Could it be a, a canvas back or redhead? I like the way you, you hedge your bets by offering multiple choices. Uh, no, it is neither of those. Oh. Uh, this is actually a duck that you guessed earlier, I think. Uh, this is about the size of a mallard. And you know, especially in like the summer months when they're in their so-called eclipse plumage, when they're very drab and similar looking, I have the hardest time telling this duck apart from a mallard. I know there are people who can do it, but I have a really hard time. I see you nodding, Brody. Did I, did I give you enough, I enough clues? I can't remember what I even said earlier. <laughs> um, yeah, well, let's show you the mail, see if that helps. Oh, gadwall. It's a gadwall, yeah. And the male is quite quite snazzy looking with these, you know, these sort of gray sides and these silvery gray tertial feathers that kind of spray out across the, the black back part of the bird. Very distinctive looking. Maybe not quite as colorful, but as some of the other male ducks, but I think pretty snazzy looking. You know, sort of has yeah, a that, muted elegance. Yeah, yeah but that say, really that really white and black contrast led me to a canvas back or a redhead. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And you know, I've actually sort of shortchanged the group in that those were some of the ducks that I did not include here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to look at canvas back. We're not going to look at lesser scop or greater scop. But all of those have that kind of sort of black and white pattern that is, is good to, you know, study and learn their characteristic head shapes and the head configuration and different things like that. Um, I just had to cut some out to, you know, save some time. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, they are all out there to be seen. All right, here is one. Sort of a, a cool little duck. Um, so it has this interesting thing it does with its tail. Like a lot of the time it will cock its tail up sort of like a, a wren or it will have its tail down like this. And it actually, and this is a diving duck. This is a duck that spends a lot of time underwater. And they will use that tail like as a, like a, I don't know, like a, the fins on a submarine or whatever. And they dive, you know, they use their little fins yeah. to kind of dive. They'll use that to kind of dive down and they'll, I don't know, it's very cool. Um, yeah. And um, the, I'm, even with this, I know that, um, I'm not going to say it yet, but um, the <laughs> males, they drum their breast to mate. And that's what impresses the females. Yeah, this very cool display. Yeah. Yeah, they drum their breath to their females and it goes like boom. Yeah, and here is the male. Ruddy and, duck. A ruddy duck. And yeah, the, the display that the male does where they kind of, they'll pump their head up and down and it's just, it's the most mm -hmm. comical thing. And uh, <laughs> I highly recommend it. You know, again, these are one of the ducks we have here uh, in the summertime. They do, I think, breed locally. Uh, so you can see them kind of doing these cool courtship things that they're doing and very comical, very cool ducks. Uh, Amy, yeah. John, John, where do you see these ducks? So uh, we see them, I mean, in the wintertime, you know, they could be around any of the local, they're around freshwater and saltwater. I don't think I've seen them off the coast so much, but in the salt marsh, you know, at high tide in the salt marsh, they could be in there, um, in the channels in the salt marsh, you could see them then. I think they have been at Lake Jocelyn. You know, we don't have a lot of wetland habitat around Carpinteria, but the little bit that we have uh, in the wintertime, if there's enough water in it, we'll get some ducks in it. Uh, Lake Jocelyn is, is, I believe, empty currently. At least it was the last time I was there. It's been dry for a while. But if we get some rain, you know, hopefully it'll fill up again and we can start getting some neat, neat waterfowl in there. Um, they might be at the little... Kim's Market Pond sometimes. I don't think they're there currently because I was there uh, last week and didn't see them. But but again, in the wintertime, as they start to fill up the local uh, waterways, you might see them there. The Kim's Market Pond is just this this weird little spot. If you haven't been there, it's it's Kim's Market on Via Real, right by the freeway. And you pull into the parking lot there, and right next door, there's this like drainage basin. It's just this cement line. It looks like a big swimming pool, and it's surrounded by by fencing and walls, it's hard to see, and you kind of have to look with one binocular tube at a time to like peek through the fence. But we get really interesting uh, ducks in there, so it's it's very important. Again, as I start to get in my Christmas bird count mode, and I'm thinking, okay, where are we going to put people for the Christmas bird count? 
we always have to hit the Kim's Market Pond because we often get species there that we don't get anywhere else in the county. So that blue beak is only during the summer, apparently. Is that correct, John? I believe it is. I believe that is, yeah, that's like its breeding plumage when it's looking really extra snazzy. Uh, but I'm not an expert on the, the different appearances. Believe your field guide. If it's saying that, then yes. That that's, what it, that, that's the photographs in the field guide say that it's only the summer male. Yeah. And, the, and it looks like the photo to the left is the winter male more than just the female, or correct me on that. Yeah, well, I, I would hesitate to correct you. Um, there's a version of it that's kind of in between that's, that's like a drabber version of the male, but doesn't have the, the stripe on the cheek. Mm. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't want to, yeah, I, you know. Yeah, I think feel... the stripe on the cheek is the female, actually, according to the photo I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, you know. Yeah. Consult your references. I, I confess I'm a little weak on my ruddy ducks because they're so distinctive. You know, their, their overall silhouette and their basic pattern is so distinctive that I'm probably guilty of not studying them as closely as I should because I can identify them very quickly and then I've moved on to looking at some more challenging bird. And, you know, I certainly would not recommend that approach to birding. That's something that I've tried to, to cure myself of over the years with greater or lesser success. But those those birds that are easy to identify are often very interesting to study. So just give them their time and you will learn more about them. And then you can answer questions better when someone says, oh, is that the, you know, the same appearance of the male and his non-breeding plumage? I'm like, I don't actually know. <laughs> but yeah. I've seen There's some in the wintertime that have bluish beak. In the wintertime, they, they have the blue, but not as bright blue as this yeah, one maybe? Right, but it's bluish. Yeah. All right, thank you, Andrea. I appreciate that input. Let's move on to some more ducks. All right, here is another little duck. This is a relatively small duck. And it is a diving duck. And the, the female, I think, is, is quite attractive in her own way, although she does sort of get upstaged by the male. Yes, Brody, what do you think we have here? Bufflehead. You are exactly right. And if she's next to her mate, he looks like that. And in flight, the, the males are just really amazing looking with all these black and white stripes everywhere. It's, it's very bold and exciting to see them go flying by. Uh, they're diving ducks as well. So if you, you know, if you go look at a local body of water and you don't see any buffalo heads, just keep looking because there may be some there that just have to pop up to the surface for you to see them. Uh, okay, we're getting fairly far along here. All right, so here's, I said that I didn't include the scops or the canvas backs. Uh, but there is one sort of similar duck that I will include because we tend to get them around carp pretty frequently in the wintertime. Um, this is, at least for me, a, a somewhat trickier duck, but you know, the female is fairly distinctive. Does anyone want to hazard a guess? All right, let's go on and, and add the male and see if it makes things easier. Ringnecked? Yeah, who said ringnecked? Andrea. Andrea, yes. Andrew, you obviously know your ducks. You're spending a lot of time out there at the salt marsh, so you see your your ducks there, right? Yeah. Well, I look at you look at the bill and you, you see the ring on the bill, and you know that it's a ring neck because it's not a ring bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the naming of these these ducks is sometimes kind of wacky. Like, why is it a ring neck duck? Is the ring visible to someone who's not looking at a museum specimen? I don't see a ring. I mean. I guess the spur, this white spur at the front of the male, which is so distinctive and very helpful, uh, you know, doesn't really make a ring though. So yeah, it's got a ring on the bill, a ring neck duck. I don't know why it's called that. Alrighty. Oh, so here I threw three species together. I was getting, I was getting lazy towards the end of putting the slides together. So I was like, all right, we're just gonna, we're gonna have a, a triple dose of these, these ducks. And, uh, um, I think um, the one in the bottom is the hooded merganser. Okay. The one just like by itself. Over here. Um, it might be a red breasted, and um, the one on the top, I think it might be a smew. Wow. 
Well, uh, if we had a SMU locally, that would be super exciting uh, because it is a very rare uh, duck in these, this part of the world. I'm not sure if there even are any records of SMU in, um. in Santa Barbara County. There could be, for all I know. There hasn't been one in the last several years, so I would have noticed. Um, <laughs> uh, so you're doing really well there. Uh, let's add the male. And so, yes, this is the hooded merganser down mm. here. Uh, this one is actually the uh, common merganser, which around here is distinctly less common. Uh, and this one up here is the red-breasted merganser. And I, um, yeah, what were you gonna say, Brody? I haven't even heard of the common merganser. I, so yeah. when I saw that big bill on the red-breasted merganser, um, I didn't. I don't really know which ones live around here or not. Um, so I just thought SMU because I knew that they lived in North America. So yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm I'm not a SMU expert. Maybe they're actually more similar than I realized. Um, but yeah, so these are the three merganser species that you can expect to get in Santa Barbara County, and mm -hmm. uh, you know the hooded is a little smaller, and that that sort of distinctive crest. You know, even the female has a version of it. Uh, and then the, the male is, is you know, super distinctive with that, that kind of amazing crest it has going on. Um, the red-breasted versus the common can be kind of tricky, but they do tend to show up in different places. So the red-breasted is the one that we get. It's the one that you tend to see on salt water. So we see it along the coast. Uh, you might see it in the salt marsh. You might see it off the beaches. Um, the common merganser is more of a freshwater species, so that's actually pretty hard to get in this part of Santa Barbara County. Um, I think the only place in Santa Barbara County I've seen common mergansers is up in the Santa Inez Valley and some of the, like Lake Kachuma is a place you can see them, or Gibraltar Reservoir. Um, and I don't even have one yet this year, so I'm watching those eBird reports. I want someone to report one from up there so I can go dashing up there to try to see it. Uh, which kind of brings something up, you know, ducks are fairly chaseable. If you're interested in this admittedly silly game of, of trying to get, you know, as many birds on your list as you can, uh, if, a, if a duck is reported that you don't have, to me, that's a pretty chaseable bird because they're just out there, you know, they're out there on the water. And if it's, you know, if it hasn't left, it's likely to still be there and still be seeable. Some of these little warblers, you know, in the fall that, that you know, some of us have had experience chasing over the last several weeks, they can be more challenging because it's a little bird in a big, grove of trees if it's even still there and you have to kind of wait for it to come into view. So. Yeah, and um, I'm just saying on the last one, I thought that um, the um, ring neck duck, I immediately thought it was a common golden eye or something like that. But um, I've had trouble distinguishing common golden eyes from the ring neck duck. And you have pointed out to me that the ring neck duck has a ring on the bill and the uh, um, the common golden eye does not. Yeah, and we do have common golden eye around here. Like I've seen them in the Carpinteria salt marsh. So, I mean, it's not a common bird by any means, but they can be around and you'll see like the female version or the, maybe it's a first year bird of either sex, I'm not sure. But yeah, but yeah. Um, I haven't actually seen them out in the field, but I've um, seen them in my book and I'm just going through my book. I cover up the name on the page and try to figure out what it is. I have played that game myself. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good game. And it's even more fun out in the field where the, the bird is actually right in front of you and you're trying to figure out what it is. Yeah, that, that's great, Brody. Um, I think that is it for ducks. So I'm going to stop the screen share and get back to where I can see people. And it's definitely not it for ducks. I mean, there are many more ducks to be seen, but those are the ones that I covered uh, for this meeting. So um, we've gone kind of a long time, which for which I apologize, but better than some, not as, One hour, not as long exactly. as for sparrows. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so any other comments or feedback or discussion? Uh, I don't see any new notes in the chat, but- Thank um, you. Oh, well, thank you, Brody, as always, for, for your participation. You add a lot to the meeting. Thank you Great. so much. Yeah, yeah, no problem, Annie. I really enjoy uh, having folks here, and we had a, a relatively big group this time, which was fun. Um, so you, you appear to be quite the, the duck fan, Brody. I know you asked for ducks specifically, and it sounds like you're spending a lot of time. So I, I you know, look forward to hearing your reports on ducks. You know, if you get out there and, and see what ducks are to be seen. We're getting to, again, the time of the year when they'll start showing up. 
you had mentioned um, that you were looking for spotted toys uh, at the last meeting we in our sparrow meeting. Have you had a chance to see any of those? Um, no, I haven't, but um, it would be really cool if I did get to see them. <laughs> yeah, well, they're out there. I mean, they're, they're hard. Yeah. I've, I've been thinking about it more because I always put them on my list when I hear them. But as I start thinking about it, I'm like, you know, I'm not actually seeing them all that often. So now when I get a chance to actually see one, it's, it, it feels more significant to be like, oh boy, if Brody were here, you could have seen that bird. Um, all right, well, uh, thank you again, everybody. Uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, so for the next meeting, we'll probably be talking about the Christmas bird count and there may be some other stuff. We'll probably do some follow-up based on the survey results that, that Tom and Laurel sent out. So people have questions about using eBird or using um, the SDCO birding email list. Uh, and, and, you know, I know uh, the Purcells, you had talked about having um, uh, just like going through like how do you learn about these rarities and how do you go see them or maybe go over some of the recent rarities. Uh, maybe we can spend some time on that at the next meeting. Hopefully there'll be a, a good crop of rarities then. We've had a great crop of rarities the last few weeks. Um, yeah. yeah. And I was just going to say um, one of the reasons that I like ducks so much is because wood ducks were my starter ducks. My the my um the, the ducks uh, they were real the wood duck is what really got me into birds. Oh, cool! Well, it's a it's a fabulous bird. There was a report of wood ducks just recently. I'm trying to remember where they were. Uh, came up in eBird um, at the end of Mission Creek at uh, Santa Barbara Beach. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So if you go up to like East Beach in Santa Barbara, or, or you know, kind of near the base of the pier, there's that little spot where some water comes out near the beach. There was a, a male wood duck in there. So that's very worth uh, checking out. You know, I don't. I it's might hard, you know. Over there. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, it's it's hard, you know. I mean, I, I can remember birding as a, as a younger person. It's like it really adds a lot to your ability to chase after birds when you get a car. You know, when you can actually yeah. drive there and see them. It can be very difficult when you're when you're not as mobile. You know, you have to get a, a, a you know helpful adult to to drive you there. Um, yeah, so. and if I did see a wood duck, that would be awesome. I mean, if I saw it, I would be so happy. And the male, yeah. that's even better. <laughs> yeah, I think it was reported. Well, you can check eBird like anyone, you know, go go look at those reports and, and you know, there's a chance it will still be there, um, yeah. you know, and if not, you know, they'll show up later. There was one at, at Lake Jocelyn last uh, year, I think. Mm. And we had one yeah. at the Kim's Market Pond on the Christmas count, I think. So, you know, they do show up here and there. So uh, keep your eye on the eBird list and, and yeah. you can find one. Oh, uh, check out the Kim's Market too. Yeah. And John, Brody, it what? doesn't matter. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Brody, I it doesn't matter how often you see a wood duck. Everyone gets so excited. It's really such a yeah. beautiful bird. Yeah, it's yeah. spectacular. And Rita, were you trying to say something? I was just going to ask, what time are you planning on starting the Christmas bird count? We've done it at different times, depending who's running it. Um, we've gone as early as, as 7 or 7.30 on some occasions. Are you planning on starting early morning or not so early? Well, I mean, it's going to be up to the individual, it'll be up to the individual participants. Uh, you know, certainly okay. depending on your level of zeal, you don't have to wait for sunrise. <laughs> I was, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been up in Romero Canyon uh, getting, getting Western screech owls for our list, you know, in previous years, and you're certainly welcome to do things like that. Okay. Um, but you know, yeah, I mean, everybody participates at their own level, you know, so we can talk about this more. We'll talk about the Christmas count more in the next few meetings. So let's, we'll save that for discussing next time, but it's a good, good topic of discussion. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Amrita. And thank you again, everybody. And uh, look you. forward to talking to you in a few weeks. Bye.